Hello, everybody. I'm Bob Sherman, and if you were with us last Wednesday, I don't need to tell you that another original and distinctive downtown music streaming session awaits today. On the other hand, if you missed that earlier event, you'll probably need a bit of catching up, most of which will be provided by singer Haley McAvoy. In the proverbial nutshell, though, Hubbard Miller was a multi-gifted man out in Oregon, largely forgotten today, but earlier on, when he wasn't rounding up cattle, he worked on Broadway in such musicals as Hair, and he created philosophical tracts, and he wrote songs for top-notch artists like Bette Midler. Haley has been developing a multimedia project she calls the Hub Miller experience, and we today will be the first to encounter it, at least part two, including a never-before-recorded song premiered with pianist Bethany Pietro Nero. And to top it all off, an interview with the founding director of Downtown Music, Tim Lewis. Should be another great hour, in other words, and I'll be back thereafter with a look ahead to next Wednesday. Haley? Take it away. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Bob, for that terrific introduction. I'm Haley, and it's my pleasure to introduce part two of the Hub Miller Experience, which you'll be seeing today thanks to Downtown Music at Grace. Part two of this concert focuses on the community that surrounded Hub. This includes his family and friends, some of the artists who premiered his work, and even his dog, who gets a mention later on in the concert. Today, we'll be kicking it off with our newly recorded song, Flowers of Summer, which Bethany and I have recorded especially for this audience. When we conclude with that song, we'll move on to some interviews that I conducted with the Miller family and with some singers who worked to, with Hub during his lifetime to premiere his songs. After those interviews, we'll continue on with more music and stories about Hub, and I so look forward to sharing those with you. Stay tuned after the conclusion of the concert for an interview between me and Tim Lewis, where you can learn a little more about Hub Club adventures. Thank you so much for tuning in today. It's really my pleasure to share the world of Hub and his music with you. Thanks and enjoy.
So if I were to ask you guys, tell me something about Hub, what would be your knee-jerk reaction? Where would you start? <laughs> I, I would say, in my case, he was a profound influence on me as a, as a person, um, first of all, and then as a, an artist. And a knew all, all the stars, and we used to sleep up in the barn. He would, he would name maybe 500 things up in the sky. So you never knew whether it was true or not, but it was so exciting. That's the first thing that I always think about. Uh, this guy in a flannel shirt and jeans and, and boots with long gray ponytails on his back was standing by the front desk. He loved things that were spontaneous uh, in, in the moment. Um, and he loved when that happened with his music. He was charming, and he was wise, and he was hysterically funny, Yeah, and he was brilliant. Had a theme, so he'd be playing Rachmaninoff or uh, something, and somebody would walk along, and then he would, he would see them coming through the living room, and then he'd switch to their theme song, you know. Very and, subtly. Yeah. Just so you could hear it only in he would use this to tease us, you know, like, don't get fussy now. That was mine. Yeah, yeah. it was, don't get fussy now. Dun, dun, and that would, dun, drive, dun, dun, dun. would drive Jolly nuts. Oh, no, so, I'd start crying. So would, he's, uh, you know, and he could oh. just, just one tiny little note, he'd be playing, and you'd hear, just subtle. Yeah. And, but it was enough to tweak you, right? And Hubbard loved to do that. You know, he loved to drive you crazy, you know. But that's what I remember from the music, that, that, that it was so, it was just such second nature. Music was just part of life, you know, it was just there. I can remember 
you know, laying under the piano or on top of the upright with a pillow to just to take a nap and you know, the vibration of, of pounding away and practicing it just it was not a it didn't keep you awake it was just part of life it, it, it was really the music was really in our lives because of that it's interesting there was another thing that was developing over a long period of time is that uh, he ultimately came out as being gay when he was 25 Something, years old yeah. And so here he was in Eastern Oregon on a cattle ranch, a real redneck area. And uh, to be gay would just uh, would get you shot, you know, in those days. And so as, as you look back now, he had a lot of challenges that most of us did not have. Sure. And, and I think that it was his ability to uh, surpass and work with those challenges and use them uh, that that made him what he was a, 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 an extremely complicated uh, wonderfully talented human being and that kind of excitement of the of the universe and life and the cosmos he, he used to tune in on that and it had different stories and variations but you know, the stars was a great place to start. But he had an infectious way of of getting you really excited about the mysteries of the universe. The words were in my diary for 15 years before I finally wrote the music as a birthday present. Anyone with a three-octave range will enjoy it. In 1976, 
a little puppy appeared at my door, and this is his story. Except, of course, he's still here.
remember this story, my friends, and here's what to do. Just answer the scratch at the door, no matter what it may be. If you give it your love, it will give it right back for you, see. That a love in the gives a meaning to life and a reason to be. And in that way, the dog is the same as you. So our next two songs were originally supposed to be performed by me and a wonderful guitarist named Austin Wall, um, but he is unfortunately sick today. So instead, um, I've arranged to have the first song shared with you through recording. Um, this recording was actually taken at the song's premiere, which happened in 1978 at, I believe it's a bookstore called Bumbershoot. Um, it was also recorded and put on air Maybe it's not a bookstore, I think it's not a bookstore, but it's called Bumbershoot. <laughs> it was also recorded and uh, broadcast over the radio, and the soprano who was singing was Barbara Coffin, um, for whom Half and Half, which Nicole recently sang, was written. Um, so here, you'll hear Barbara Coffin singing and her daughter accompanying her on guitar. pianist Orlando has graciously agreed to play with me at last minute notice. <laughs> Thank you. 
by late 1982, Hubbard Miller was experiencing increasingly severe stomach pains. He had always believed he would die young, and perhaps this fatalistic attitude was a factor in his putting up with the discomfort for an imprudent amount of time. When he finally visited a doctor, a somewhat reassuring diagnosis diagnosis of an ulcer caused Hubbard Miller to delay further treatment. By the fall of 1982, the increasing intensity of the pain motivated him to seek another opinion. Surgery, after Thanksgiving, revealed cancer of the stomach, which had spread to his pancreas and liver. The doctors saw no hope for his recovery. The cancer was so advanced that Hubbard Miller had very little time left to live. Determined to avoid measures which would extend his life, but result in costly and dehumanizing hospitalization, Hubbard Miller went home to Jolly and Dorothy Miller's to spend the final weeks of his life. A steady stream of visitors and callers were evidence to the number of people who loved Hub Miller and whose lives had been touched by his music and his large spirit. Hub died at the Miller home on Christmas Day, 1982, at the age of 48. The last entry of his journal was dated Thanksgiving, 1982. I give thanks today for everything, for the miracle of existence, that something should be instead of nothing. I give special thanks to our unique place within the fabric of all things, Consciousness, that puzzling part of the universe that perceives itself and that looks back on its own natural evolution in wonder and awe. And this that transforms in an instant all the vast material structure of its coming to be into a single matterless mystery, thought. I give thanks for love, a curious coincidence of mammalian behavior that has elevated living from nearly being there to joy, sorrow, pain, and sharing. Finally, I give thanks to the good fortune I have had to connect to this universe through you, my dear friends and family.
As we near the end of today's introduction to Hub, I would like to thank you all so much for being here. Hub Miller's music came into my life five years ago, and it has led me on some unbelievable adventures, um, including the opportunity to form just some wonderful friendships and wonderful relationships. Um, and one of those is with the Miller family. And I'm also so grateful to Peter Miller and Lee J. Knightley for being here today from Oregon for the concert. Um, I'm so grateful that I've gotten the chance to know the Miller family, and hopefully I'll be meeting again soon, meeting them again soon. Anyway, um, I just wanted to say that, to give you a little idea of where this project is hopefully going, um, in my dreams, I would like to publish the music, record it, and tour it all around the country. Um, at this point, I would like to share an excerpt of a letter which Hub wrote to baritone Don Collins on January 16th, 1981. Don gave me a copy of this letter this past summer, and it has served as a guiding light for me as I continue my work on this project. Dear Don, it is 8 a.m. and I am here at the kitchen table enjoying the first cup of coffee and cigarette of the day, watching the sun ooze up over the cascades and touch the frost and fog with life and beauty. The freeway is humming like the ancient ocean as the workaday world buzzes back and forth. Another day begins. But this day will be a little better, a little richer and warmer and kinder and holier than all the trillions of days that have preceded it because of you and what you did last night. For my part, it was an extremely important experience. The first time I have ever heard my songs performed as a member of the audience and amidst other music. I thought they held up beautifully, in some cases surpassed. And where do we go from here? day by day, struggling to feed our families and make ends meet, keeping the fire alive and passing civilization on to our children. I will continue writing and hoping that someday, probably by accident, something will come along that will get some of this music published and that it won't all be lost when I die. For you proved to me that it is worth keeping. As for you, you need to sing and live. The only thing that will improve on last night's performance is having sung those songs to an audience a hundred times. It will bring them a kind of spiritual maturity that only age and experience can provide. Your performance was such a success because you chose so carefully good songs that mean something to you and therefore to us. Continue to search for more songs covering the whole spectrum of human experience. The songs are there, and if they're not, we'll write them. Love and many thanks, Hub. We will conclude the Hub Miller experience with one last song, Rum Stick a Fum a Diddle. <laughs> Hub based this piece on a campfire song which his grandmother taught him. And the song is, in my view, a thank you to his grandmother for the gift of music. When I sing this song, I sing it as a thank you to my teacher, Carol Weber, for introducing me to the music of Hub Miller and for a thousand other things. Professor Weber, I would never be the singer or the artist that I am today or the person that I am today without you, um, without your support, and your love. And so, this song is a big old thank you for you. Rum, take a plum, a little ox, took a periwinkle in, come and nippy cat, hit him with a boot jack, no! Why, dear old grandma, she's not really strong. 
Thank you, Haley. That was absolutely terrific. And I am so grateful to you for sharing this material with us. I uh, knew uh, when you first showed it to me last spring that uh, you know, this was something special, but it never occurred to me that we'd be using it in this format and in this day and age in this way. But it's it's been just perfect. And, you know, maybe um, if we could talk a little bit about what Hub's music means to you. I know just from the way you've performed it and all the effort you've put in, uh, clearly it's a, it's a very special thing to you. But um, his music seems to have an extraordinary effect on people in general. And I know the first time that I heard um, uh, one of his songs, it was being sung by a colleague of yours, well, Addie Rose Forstman, who's been on the Downtown Music Series. And uh, Addie Rose just said, well, go talk to Haley. She knows more about Hub than, than anybody else in the world. And um, But I think why I wanted to talk to you and why I was so intrigued initially is that the emotional impact and the directness of the song I heard, which was uh, Little Stream, uh, just seemed so uh, immediate to me and, and profound. And yet it had this sort of... Um, uh, almost implied simplicity, but then the more I started to study it, the more sophisticated it became. So, so all of this became sort of a, a, a quest for me too, in, in some funny way, and uh, something that had touched my heart, but then also made me want to know more about the person who wrote it. You know, Tim, and this is amazing because I feel like you just described also my first experience with Hub's song. So many common elements. Um, I first heard Hub songs when I was a freshman at the Eastman School of Music. That oh. was in 2013. And I, of course, was so enthusiastic to be at Eastman, so excited. And I was so proud to be studying with the soprano Carol Weber. Uh, and of course, as a young student of hers, I was trying to find recordings of her from her career when she was singing. And I came across actually a CD that she had made for her students that she had put in the Sibley Music Library at Eastman. And it featured selections that she had presented in recitals over the span of three or four decades. And so we could hear the way that her voice evolved over time, which was a huge gift to me. And of course, in my enthusiasm, I sat down with this two disc CD and I just basically inhaled the whole thing, 60 <laughs> tracks in one sitting. And out of all 60 tracks, I mean, they were all terrific, but out of all 60, there were these four songs that I just, I just could not believe. I had to pause the CD after each one and say, what was that? And I was just so grateful that after the first one, there was another, and then there was a third, and then there was a fourth. And all I knew was that after the track, it said Miller. I thought, okay, who is this guy? And it really was, to me, it was the combination of the simplicity and sincerity that was both in the music and in the words. Yeah. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, like not only this music, but who wrote these words? And I, I really booked it to my next lesson. And in talking to Carol, you know, I said, listen, I listened to that whole CD and of the whole thing, I just have to ask you, who is that Miller person. Ah. And she laughed and gave me a big smile and pointed to a portrait that was hanging right next to her piano. So ah. it was always very close to her during the day. And she said, that's one of my best friends, Hub. And ah. she told me in that moment, just enough about him, four minutes worth about his life and a little bit of what he was like, just enough that I really, my curiosity got peaked. And I just could not stop thinking about him. I, I mean, really, it was like I had a crush on him or something. I was thinking about him first thing in the morning, last thing before I went to sleep at night. It was crazy. And I wound up uh, deciding with Carol's blessing to declare a second degree for my time at Eastman that would be like a research degree that was an option for undergraduates to add to their major, a research degree on a topic of one's own choosing. And my topic was the life and times of Hubbard Miller. And the concert that you've just presented so kindly in two parts for Downtown Music was sort of the grand finale of that degree that I did at Eastman. 
Oh, well, well, it's fascinating. And, you know, I mean, the other thing that I did want to ask you, and I guess this comes out of our having similar reactions to his music, was that this format that you did it in seems so um, well suited to what we're hoping to do with downtown music right now, but, but we're in a very special circumstance. So earlier when you were doing this at Eastman, uh, it's as though you almost needed all of these, uh, the, the multimedia to capture everything he about this guy. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a big personality. Yeah, and I really, I mean, with the musical arts degree that I was doing, it's, it's a degree that blends academic work with musical work. So typically the final presentation that people would give at the conclusion of this degree would be like a lecture recital, you know, that where people present music and they write a big paper and they sort of share excerpts from their paper along with their music with an audience and they field questions. Um, and I knew that I wanted to do something like a lecture recital, but I really wanted it to be a little bit less like a thesis statement or a paper and a little bit more like a personal introduction. Like if I could, if I could let you meet Hub, if he were still here and you could meet him for one hour, what might you take away from that? And it was really, again, phenomenal support from the Eastman School of Music. I, over the course of my studies, applied for a grant from their Institute for Music Leadership. Uh -huh. uh, and I won the grant money that allowed me to go out to the Pacific Northwest and meet Hub's family and a bunch of his friends and collect primary sources beyond my wildest dreams that all got funneled into making this Meet Hub Miller final concert. Right. Well, well I, I truly feel as though I've, I've met the man having watched uh, you know, what, what you've created. And I, I know, uh, you know I, I think at, at one point you told me that, that uh, you even went down to, to making one of his bread recipes for the recital and, and making it a total <laughs> sensory experience uh, you know, that, that people could have that. Yeah, I, I got for, for the recital reception, I got his homemade bread recipe from his sister-in-law. And it was really, really nice to share that, of course, with everyone who came to my recital. And two of the people in the audience were actually members of Hub's family, which was also Aww. just, it's been such a huge gift to share this music with them and to be so warmly welcomed into the sort of Miller family, the Hub Club, as it were, as I call it. Um, it's really the, the warmth that I have felt and that I, I hope they all have felt too has been one of the highlights of this whole experience. Oh, oh. well, I, I am so glad that, that you have pursued all of this. And I know, you know, I mean, if, if you had been doing some, you know, dusty uh, uh, Northern European Baroque composer or something for this, you, you would have spent a lot of time in an, a library and looked up all of these sort of secondary and tertiary sources and, uh, you know, great work, but not always uh, enlivening and a lot of fun. But so here you are, though, you're going to the Pacific Northwest, you're meeting this guy's family. And what was it like? I mean, was it, was it sort of scary or great? Or? <laughs> uh, so I, it's a funny story, actually. I mean, the first time I ever reached out to the Millers was my freshman year at Eastman because I became aware of a book of Hub's writings. I mean, you just said if I were researching some composer of days of yore, I could probably go to the library and find something about him, right? Right. But with the case of Hub, that's not true. You know, I looked, I looked in every library I could find and I found very little. And the couple things I found, one was a book of his writings that a friend of his published after he passed away. And I wrote to, the, to Hub's brother, Peter, and said, because he's the one that was in charge of the book. And I, I wrote and said, oh, can I, can I get this book? And, you know, sent him a check and I got the book. And then we sort of didn't talk for a while. And, you know, meanwhile, I was doing my work at Eastman and I was getting more and more into Hub's music and I was trying to share it with really wide audiences. And this one summer, I went to sing at Songfest in Los Angeles mm -hmm. and I brought two of Hub's songs with me because I thought, all right, you know, new part of the country, lots of people. If I get a chance to, you know, get up on stage and sing some Hub Miller, it's my time to really sing out and really go for it. And it was one of the most unbelievable days of my life 
that on the last day of Songfest, in the morning, I sang in a master class with the American composer Jake Heggie. Yep. And I met I met him that way. Oh. And then in the afternoon, I sang on a different concert of American song. And one of the people in the audience was American baritone Thomas Hampson. Ah. Now, I was singing a song that was not a hub song, but Thomas Hampson really liked it. And as I was leaving that concert, he stopped me in the cafeteria and mentioned that a singer who was supposed to appear on a masterclass with him had suddenly fallen ill. And he was wondering if I might sing the song I had sung on the concert earlier in his masterclass. And now, in this moment, I am telling you, it was like my guardian angel spoke instead of me. I don't know why I did this, but I remembered my teacher Carol saying to me, I wish Tom Hampson knew Hub Miller's songs. And here I was talking to Thomas Hampson. So I said to him, I would love to sing on your masterclass, but only if I can share a song by a composer named Hubbard Miller, whom my teacher Carol Weber wants you to know bargaining with Thomas Hampson. <laughs> and he said, all right. Yeah. He said, I'll make you a deal. We're going to work on the song you sang earlier, but before you sit down, you can sing your Hud Miller song. So later that day in this big master class, I sang a Hud Miller song for Thomas Hampson. And in the audience of said master class was Jake Heggie, oh. who, when the master class was over, approached me and basically said he was really moved by the music and would like to know more about it uh -huh. and that he actually would be interested in arranging the song I had sung for the Dallas City Street Choir to perform at Carnegie Hall with Frederica von Stade as soloist. <laughs> and he said, can you put me in touch with the Miller family so I can get the rights? And of course I said, oh, no problem. Yes, I can. Meanwhile, I hadn't spoken with the Miller family myself in, you know, three years. And so then all of a sudden, when I got home from California, I wound up writing the Miller family an email and my fingers were shaking while I was typing because I just was like, all of a sudden I have so much to tell you guys and I don't even know where to start. Aww. And out of that correspondence evolved the, the thought that I should come out and visit they were very enthusiastic about Jake Heggie's arrangement, which happened at Carnegie Hall in 2017. Um, but even more than that, you know, out of that experience really was born our contact that we've maintained up to the present that led to me coming out there um, and getting to know them all. And oh. they were just so incredible to me. It's kind of, I mean, I felt that it was a very big deal to walk out there and say to someone, I really care about your brother. I love his music and I feel like I know him. Right. You know, but the fact of the matter is I don't and I never did. Mm -hmm. And I never wanted to be like some scholar who would just stroll in and claim to know everything about a family. That I, I was I was cautious about doing that. Yeah. And that so I really wanted to um build a friendship. Yeah. And they were all so warm and open and welcoming to me that that is indeed what happened. Oh, <laughs> fabulous story. And, and uh, thank you. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's one of those sort of uh, serendipitous things that, that, that it's just seems to, to run through the life of Hub's music and uh, the people who get involved with it. it, it it's just, it's extraordinary. So, um, I feel just that way. It's like a force. There's some kind of a force. It's bigger than me. It feels yeah. like it's bigger than any one of us. And yep. it's really, it lives in the music. And it's what's connecting everyone who cares about Hub and his music yeah. at this time. Yeah. And, I, you know, I mean, I have to say, I've, I've experienced it when I've been playing some of his accompaniments and, and just looking at the, there's something that sort of goes on within me. And it's, it's this this uh, desire to know more, but also a sense of, of the real um, uh, joy and, and grace that is, is, is in inside of this stuff. But I'm wondering from a singer's perspective, what, what's music like to sing? Man, well, you know, I would say like all really good music, it's connected to communication 
-hmm. And so when I'm singing Hub's songs, the thing that's primary in my mind is always to really communicate the meaning of the words and the poetry and to invite people into that world. And it's, I mean, it's interesting because the music is about such profound things so often. I feel like as a performer, there's a balance you have to strike between, of course, looking very closely. Am I singing all the notes right? All the rhythms right? Am I getting every entrance? I mean, some of the songs, particularly the ones that Bethany and I have just recorded, are tricky. Yeah. And it takes, you know, it takes some real, some real study to get, get that stuff internalized. But then once it's in there, it's, it's sort of about letting it go and letting it reflect the universe in the way that it does and yeah I don't know to just like let it blossom I think from yeah. the performer and to like let the music speak more loudly than anything else mm -hmm. so that's always my goal yeah. and my hope is always to have enough time and space within myself that the music can really be amplified by me and people will hear the music itself instead of just Oh, she's a nice singer. Yeah, you know what I mean. No, no, I, I, I certainly do. And and you, as, as you're saying that, it's got me thinking about this whole process of composition and the composer having an idea uh, within that is then transcribed onto a piece of paper that then goes to another human being to bring it to life again, if you will. And that what's on the the piece of paper that that that, that if anything gets in the way of this direct link between the composer and the performer. And it's as though, you know, you're, you're uh, well, channeling for lack of a better word, uh, the intentions of the composer, uh, you know, a, as you sing or perform uh, the composer's music. So it's, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful approach. So grateful to you for doing all of that. Um, let's maybe, maybe close today by, uh, exploring where you might want to go from here with this because i know you've, you've done the research you've you've got manuscripts you've you've uh you know uh looked at, at all sorts of uh you know the technical aspects of of furthering uh hubs music in the world but but what would, what would you like to do next or is there a next uh, with this and what might that look like yes i would say that i have two big goals for this project and they are proving tricky just because they both will take a lot of time and a lot of planning, a lot of coordination. Uh, but the first is to get the music officially published. Um, and that I'm working with the Millers and we are, yes, hoping to get the songs officially published, especially as Hubs fan club continues to grow. People want to sing these songs and we want to make sure that they can because they deserve to be heard. They're absolutely terrific. Um, and then the other thing that I'm hoping to oversee is a professional recording of the complete Hub Miller songbook, uh, which, yeah, I mean, I've got big dreams of all sorts of people that I would love to have as guests on this recording so that it will just, Hub songs will really get amplified by pretty fantastic uh, voices. But as of yet, that's sort of in a little bit in the dream phase. I'm looking into some grants and some different plans um, that I will be working toward perhaps this spring to maybe bring that dream a little closer to reality. But it's definitely the goal that we'll be able to share Hub's songs uh, even more easily and more widely with the audience ever expanding that is coming to know and love them. Oh, uh, well, 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 thank you, Haley, and thank you so much for all of your time with this. Um, you know, if, if people want some more information, uh, they can, can absolutely contact us through the Downtown Music website, which is dtmusic.org. But is, is there also, um, you know, a, a website uh, possibly for Hubs Music or, or a way that, that you, you might be able to field questions directly as well? Yes, of course. Uh, there is a website about Hub, which his brother Peter Miller runs. So that's hubmiller.com. And feel free to check that out if you want to learn a little more. On the website, you'll also find that there is a book of Hub's writings. I mentioned it earlier in this interview uh, that I, I believe his college roommate published after he passed away. 
but that book is really full of phenomenal insights and you know short essays and short stories um, and that book is also available for purchase you can find it on hub's website if you're interested in learning more about the man the myth the musical awesome guy hub miller um, and then there's also a facebook page called the hub club uh, it's been a bit dormant as of late but plans to return with vim and vigor uh, soon as we have more updates to release about the hub project Terrific. Well, 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 thank you again for all of your, your time with us today. And importantly, uh, we do need to say that as wonderful as all of this is as, as a virtual experience, um, we do hope to bring you to Downtown Music as soon as it's possible uh, to have you and, and some colleagues uh, do this music live because there's nothing like experiencing it, uh, uh, you know, real in person and in real time. So thank so the you. The best thing to me, the best way to get through these times is to have wonderful stuff like that to look forward to. So I'm so grateful. Well, we're so grateful to you and thank you so much. All right, thanks, Tim. Bye-bye. Bye. What a fascinating hour. And thanks to Haley McAvoy and just now her conversation with Tim Lewis. We all know about Hub Miller, obviously a remarkable character and fine songwriter into the bargain. Next week, we will continue exploring what my WQXR colleague George Jelinek called the vocal scene, but with a different slant. It's going to be a live streamed home visit with Abigail Fisher, not just a young singer, but a composer and master of improvisational sound pieces. Not sure exactly what those are, but we will find out together. Meanwhile, if you can, we hope you will live stream a donation to Downtown Music in appreciation of these fine free programs and to help keep them financially viable right through to next spring. The website is dtmusic.org and just click the donate button, it's down on the left side, and you'll have the satisfaction of knowing that you are a producing partner in these wonderful presentations. Stay well, everybody. I'm Bob Sherman.